a cahoots for you too. So week eight has a lot to it. So just try to keep up. If you get caught behind for whatever reasons, again, just let me know what's going on and I can give you little extensions if you need to. I know it's a rough week, okay? But the only way you can get it is communication. Just like you'd communicate with a doctor when a patient's going bad. Well, you're not getting it all done. I'm the doctor. Please communicate with me and I can help you, okay? I'm easy to get to and I'm easy to get answers from. So GI, GU. So let's start out with GU, gastro or gen, genital urinary, excuse me, it's not gastrointestinal. So we're talking about kidneys, ureters, and we're talking about bladder and anything that can go wrong with the kidneys or the ureters or the bladder. <laughs> Now, urinary tract infections, most common thing you see uh, an infection with children. We know that children tend to not wipe right. They go from back to front. We know that urethras are really short, right? And girls, so that stool goes right up into the bladder and can cause um, infections. We also know that these uh, kids, uh, little girls love bubble baths, right? We can't let them sit in there if they're having frequent urinary tract infections because of that little short, open, wide ureter, uh, urethra. And then the water gets up in there and could cause infections on them. How do we take care of you know, uh, these urinary tract infections? Well, number one, we need to go out and find out what is the disease? What's the bacteria that's causing it? So we're going to do either a catheterized urine on your little infants or your older kids. We actually can get a good midstream. I have seen parents stand their little kids up on the sink, wipe them off, tell them to pee and catch it in the uh, bathrooms, in the hospitals in order to get it good. Whichever way works, you know, it's okay. Bags, I still don't believe in because you're getting all that skin contaminant inside the bag. So then you're getting a culture on skin contaminant, not the real urinary tract infection, okay? Now, once we have these urinary tract infections, we've taken the antibiotic and it's all cleared up. We've gone back to the doctor. Um, make sure that little girls, little cotton underwear and loose pants. I mean, I know those cute little tights are great today, but they're more synthetic material, right? And that's going to cause it to heat in there and it's going to cause more infections. So cotton underwear is really going to help, all right? Now, boys that are uncircumcised, that the parents don't pull back that foreskin, that's another site of infection. You know, in between the foreskin and the penis, that little white stuff is called schmegma. I call it a Petri dish for boys. And that's where bacteria will go in there and it will grow. And then it gets up into the urethra and then it causes the infection. So pulling it down and cleaning it, we can stop those uncircumcised boys from having infections. And always make sure that child finishes all the antibiotics. They don't, the infection's gonna continue and we can hurt the kidneys. Now, what do you see? Well, this is a kid, maybe like a little girl holding their their, their their pee pee, right? They're holding it and they're bent over and they're running back and forth to the bathroom. If we look, it might be red down there. The urine's not gonna smell good. And um, sometimes you're gonna see them lose their urine and be incontinent, especially if they're already potty trained. This is something that you say, all right, we need to check urine. So, Prevention of urinary tract infections, number one, making sure that they drink plenty of fluids. That's always good. It keeps their, their bladder flowing. Um, always checking, looking at the kid. Are they frequently running to the bathroom? Are there any signs there? Or how does that urine smell? Going in and making sure that we're being aware of those things. And then again, wiping front to back is the big thing. And Adolescents, we're like preventing urinary tract infections. You know, a lot of adolescents are uh, sexually active. What they say is that um, adolescent with frequent urinary tract infections who is sexually active 
if they can urinate as soon after intercourse, that actually can prevent urinary tract infections. So how are we gonna get a urinary uh, culture and sensitivity on a little kid? Maybe they're a pound and a half, which means they're weighing, oh, 750 grams. I mean, this is little. Well, we're gonna be doing what we call a suprapubic um, aspiration. Whenever we have young premature infants running a fever, we do a complete septic workup and that includes doing a suprapubic aspiration. What they do is they put on sterile gloves, they have that area clean right above the symphysis pubis and they take a needle and go straight down and they withdraw a little bit of urine. And that little bit of urine is all you need for the culture and then it will be accurate. There's all different ways. Uh, sometimes the, the kidneys are where all the infection are, doing those kidney taps. Um, going in, sometimes we need to, with frequent, frequent urinary tract infections, we're going to be doing voiding cystoureserographies. This is that kid is almost a couple years old now and still continuing with urinary tract infections. And what they do is they put dye in there and they look and they probably can see a lot of that extra material or mucus that's in there that maybe that's what's collecting the infection. And we look at them before and after they void and we look to see is it going up the ureters because sometimes those sphincters in the ureters that goes to the vesicle, the bladder, it's open. They're not good and tight and it flows up. And when it goes up the ureters, we can go into the kidneys. So looking at all those things are ways that we can help find out the cause of the urinary tract infections. Now, many times we have to do a renal biopsy on a child. Now, again, always tell them it may hurt, all right? Because yes, we use um, numbing creams and we use numbing as we're putting the needle in there. We do all of those things. And um, some of the younger kids, we even knock out for like a conscious sedation type for these procedures. Um, but we'll need to treat them very similar to a cardiac cath, believe it or not. Number one, they get that pressure dressing or maybe a sandbag if they're older, because you could leak urine out underneath the skin or blood or it could be coming out on the dressing. So making sure that that area has a good pressure bandage on there can make sure that we're gonna let that kidney where we punctured it heal well. These kids watching vital signs, watching for any abdominal tenderness because the kidneys will go into the peritoneal cavity with urine and it's acid. So it's really gonna irritate the organ. So you'll have abdominal pain or you're going to see a saturated uh, dressing. So these are things we'd report to the doctor. Of course, you're touching a kidney, you're going to be monitoring that intake and output. And these kids, again, like cardiac cath, you can't get them out of bed. 24 hours, give a chance for that kidney to heal over so that it won't leak urine, it won't leak blood, okay? And these kids, again, the older they are, just tell them they're going to feel touching the back. Um, very similar to like a uh, spinal tap. You're in the back, you're touching back there and they will be poking, but they've gotten really good about using more and more uh, type of Novocaine, even as they're injecting needles down more than they ever did before. Now, as I said, sometimes your ureters and those little sphincters, they don't work. So you've got the vesicle, which is what we call the bladder, and it's making some of the urine going up. And we know the vesicle is not as sterile as the kidneys, okay? There might be some port of entry there because the urethra is so small, okay? So we don't want it to go up and we don't want it to touch the kidneys because we don't want kidney damage. Now, sometimes there's strictures, sometimes it's open. It could be one side, it could be two sides. Um, could be complete, incomplete, but this is why a kid with a frequent urinary tract infection or a pyelonephritis is going to be getting those VCUGs and um, those renal scans, et cetera. We're looking for this abnormality. And if it is a stricture, we want to open it, maybe put a stent in there, or maybe, you know, cut pieces out and put them back together again. All different things could be done, but it can explain why. So remember, the bladder is called a vesicle, 
all right? So vesicle ureter reflux is the bladder up into the ureters, okay? Kidneys would be just a hydronephrosis, but remember bladder is a vesicle. Now, nephrotic syndrome, and I'm gonna say something three times. This is not kidney failure. Has nothing to do with kidney failure. This is not kidney failure. Your kidneys produce urine. The problem with nephrotic syndrome is that for some reason, it doesn't hold protein. So your kidneys become a protein getting rid of machine. So what are you gonna see? What does protein do in the body, right? So you're gonna see protein in the urine, protein urea. And it looks like a beer, the foaming. That's all the protein you see there. But remember protein is intravascularly, right? And it helps with blood um, and giving um, medicines, especially toxic medicines. And if we don't have protein in the blood, you've gotta be very careful with dosing medications, right? No protein, it's all gonna be free flowing. So it's gonna be free in the blood and levels are gonna be high and could be toxic in many cases. Especially what if you have to give one of those aminoglucoside, a CIN, right? Like vancomycin, like amicacin, gentamicin, right? Those things are can be very toxic, ototoxic and nephrotoxic. So be very careful of administering drugs to a child with nephrotic syndrome. Now, because there's no protein in intravascularly, the blood tends to go and the plasma goes interstitial. There's nothing to keep it in there. The protein is gone. There it's, it becomes a very hypotonic solution. So it wants to find a way to balance. It goes to the tissue. What are you gonna see? This kid, usually what you see very much first uh, sight, big swollen eyes, very puffy. And you're like, oh, this kid is puffy. And if they have nephrotic syndrome, you know they're in trouble because this is all about that protein that is lost in the kidneys. So nephrotic syndrome, they're immunosuppressed, okay? They are at a extreme high risk for infection. Now, a lot of that interstitial swelling could be in the mouth. So when they're chewing, they're biting on their gums and it hurts. So they have a loss of appetite. Makes sense, doesn't that? Now, salt restriction? Well, you're edematous. Of course, we're gonna restrict salt and fluid. These kids do need to feel like they're normal. They need to be up, they need to be moving, but they need a good support of their family and their home care because they will be on fluid restriction. They'll be on salt restrictions for life. Now, what we need to do is with these children know that they are at risk for infection. Always washing hands is a big thing. That's the number one way of preventing infections in anyone. But because this has to do with fluid balance and holding and edema, I and O and daily weight, nursing priority. If they're gaining weight, they're gaining fluids, okay? So we'll need to do something else, maybe give them some sort of diuretic to help get rid of it. And, but if we see it going down, we know that our treatment is working. Now, acute glomerular nephritis is just like rheumatic fever caused by a strep throat. What do you see in acute glomerular nephritis? Well, this is the kidneys. They're having a problem on the glomerular level and they stop urinating. You don't urinate, you're gonna swell. And with that swelling comes high blood pressure, okay? A lot of the times you will see blood and protein in the urine. So as I said, it's caused by a not treated or undertreated strep infection maybe three weeks ago, okay? Now, we're gonna treat it with antibiotics. And we're gonna give those antibiotics a longer amount of time, and we're going to um, heal uh, the kidney, and usually it will take care of the glomerular nephritis, and it will only be an acute stage. Very rarely does it become a chronic condition, as long as it's treated as soon as we start to see what's going on and the kidneys haven't been damaged. 
So again, we're edematous, right? We're swelling, has to do with the kidneys, interstitial type stuff. So again, low sodium fluid restrictions. And at this time, they're extremely susceptible to infections. Sounds like nephrotic syndrome, doesn't it? Also, daily weights and accurate measuring of intake output. Whenever you talk about fluid, whether they're holding it or losing it, always think intake output daily weights. That's how we measure it. Now, Wilms tumor is a tumor that is on the kidney. I've seen one in my whole career. It was a, a little boy, age three or four, from Haiti after the Haitian earthquake. And our hospital went down. This is what, 10 years ago now, but I'll never forget this little guy. Some religious group picked him up at the airport and delivered him to my triage room with records that were in French. So I couldn't even read what was going on. So I had to do an assessment. Well, Wilms tumor are African-American boys, ages three to five, seven, that area right there. And what you see is some sort of tumor in the abdomen off the kidney. Now, this little boy, I did vital signs, neuro checks, listened to the lungs, and then I listened to the abdomen. And when I got to the left lower quadrant, there was like a soft ball mass in this little abdomen. And I don't even know why I remembered, but I knew that that was a Wilms tumor. So immediately I put on the chart, do not palpate the abdomen now. We don't do biopsies on this. We don't touch it because any sort of manipulation can cause metastasis. So little pieces break off and goes in the peritoneum, the peritoneal cavity, and now you have a spread cancer. They do chemo radiation, maybe both, maybe one, maybe the other. I mean, all treatments are slightly different. And then they do surgery. And remember, they're going through the abdomen to the back, which is where the kidneys are. So you have a lot of manipulation in the intestines and you always, you know, so you're gonna worry about bowel function afterwards, right? And we also are gonna be worried about, you know, urine because it was a kidney tumor. So we have to make sure intake and output are good. So that's the Wilms tumor. Do not palpate, leave it alone. And when you have a kid who's with a diaper, you have to be very careful. Now, there are reasons why children get uh, renal failure, okay? This is the true and real renal failure. This is not nephrotic syndrome. This is when the kidneys stop working and aren't functioning up to the level that they should be. It could be due to an acute stage for some reason. It could be that urinary tract obstruction, the ureters is now putting, you know, the urine is not draining down into the bladder, the vesicle, and now is causing the kidneys to get high nephrosis, and now the kidney's going to be dying. And that could cause renal failure. So obstruction, kidney disease, or maybe some sort of shock where, you know, the kidneys are not perfused. All of those things can cause it. And chronic renal failure is that that kidney disease is more advanced, um, didn't catch it in time, or, or it could be a congenital abnormality. So what do you see with kidney failure? Well, you see a lot of different things. You know, you know your urine starts to decrease, uh, you become metabolic acidotic, and we know it has a lot to do with potassiums that are going on there. So look at the most common pathologic cause, dehydration. Dehydration is really bad in children. And one of the things that's a priority is correcting dehydration in children. And we're going to go on that more when we get into GI and what to do and what the treatment for dehydration would be. But you can see how important it is. Chronic renal failure is when, you know, the kidneys are... Um, more than 50% has been destroyed and they're going to be requiring some sort of device to help them drain their urine. As I said, it could be an infection, it could be those refluxes, but then remember anaphylactic 
a purpura. You have to go into anaphylaxis. It could kill your kidneys, right? Because there could be a hypoxic episode during it, or it could have attacked your kidneys. And lupus, lupus attacks all sorts of organs. So it can attack the kidneys also. So how do we take care of these children? Now, I, was, I did have the ability, um, I was a nursing supervisor um, over some students and we went into the hospital I'm from and I worked on a floor on clinicals that I never worked on before. And it was the GUGI floor. And the dialysis unit was right there. So I got to see a lot of these kids in dialysis and got to talk to a lot of the nurses about reasons and whatnot and why I didn't realize so many kids were on dialysis. There's more than you really can understand. We know that the kidneys don't make enough, you know, hemoglobin hematocrit um, because of the erythropoietin. Now, this is when we would be giving erythropoietin subcutaneous injections to help those kidneys make their own red blood cells and prevent having you know, too many blood transfusions. Now, they're gonna get blood transfusions, but if we can decrease it by one or two, I mean, that is gonna be the best. And of course, we want these kids to try to be as normal and active as possible. You know, I know that those dialysis nurses had these kids doing all sorts of things. Um, and they had like, uh, you know, they would do a needlepoint or they would be doing these scrapbooks and make things for other kids. And, you know, they had them busy and learning and being productive those four or five hours, whatever it is on dialysis. Now, today, actually, even in the adult world, what they're trying first, if possible, is to put them on peritoneal dialysis. And what they do is they take a tube and put it in the peritoneum. And they put on a machine, and this machine will put in a certain amount of fluid that the doctor orders and let it sit there for whatever the doctor says, and then it drains. And what it does, it absorbs all of these things that the kidneys would have done and is put into this fluid, which is put back, um, you'll have it, you know, dumped out. And each one of these is called a cycle. So you put in, it stills or stays there, and then it drains. That's a cycle. And it's at night. So these kids can have a normal every day, but at night we're giving this uh, opportunity. Now, infants cannot be on hemodialysis because too much blood flow and it flows into their brain and it, the brains are more fragile and can cause uh, interventricular hemorrhages. So we don't put them on the little, little kids. Um, it's usually after three, I would say, that we start putting them on hemodialysis. Your job in peritoneal dialysis is to keep that peritoneum free from infection. Now, what happens if all of a sudden you see a weird color coming out or redness or tenderness in the abdomen? Number one, you are gonna call the doctor immediately and get some antibiotics started because that's their kidneys and it's infected. We need to protect that peritoneal cavity to do that, okay? So their abdomen is that semi-permanal membrane it uses for filtration. You know, these dressings they put on, uh, we do them every time they have their peritoneal dialysis. I had a parent in one of my, um, this uh, special needs daycare that I also did clinicals at, put on a dressing as good as me, and I'm pretty OCD. And that little kid lived up to age three till when he had his kidney transplant and never had one infection. So it can be done. You know, he was an amazing kid. Um, full of life and joy, and the mother really was dedicated, um, as evidenced by no infections, and those dressings were perfect. So we put warm diastolate or that fluid in there, let it sit and drain. So if you see that fluid color changing or that redness or tenderness in the abdomen, you really need to call that doctor immediately. You know, you're not going to have antibiotics on standby call the doctor and he's gonna order what he wants, okay? It's always what students wanna do, give antibiotics. Well, where's your order? Call the doctor. And these are done at home. Adults and children, it's great. 
<laughs> so what best describes acute glomerular nephritis? Which one is that from? B. Right, just like rheumatic mm -hmm. fever. So two diseases are called by strep throats that are not treated. So again, does that emphasize how you should really teach these parents and children take every single dose? Okay, let's go to GI. Remember, GI is mouth to anus and everywhere in between and everything that's connected. So it's all your insides basically, except your heart and lungs. Now, one of the things that can happen in children is nutritional disorders. Uh, because they're not absorbing it, they don't have the enzymes to digest it, something's not right. So these are vitamins that are just, you know, through the stool and out the rectum. They're not used and they're not retained. Um, cancer, HIV, of course, uh, sickle cell is one of them. I mean, cystic fibrosis, we've learned that they have to take pancreatase, right, to be able to hold it. And they lose all of their fat vitamins. So very important that we know that these children are going to have issues so that we can be monitoring them closely and make sure that if they get their supplements or whatever they need to help retain those are good. And then any kid with low birth weight, it means they're just not eating as much as they should. Again, that could be something that's going on. It's one of the reasons why, again, why we do height and weight on every visit on every child in the pediatric world. We always do. Now, celiac disease is your small bowel. And your small bowel cannot tolerate certain amount of wheat, rye, barley, and oats. Those sort of things. It cannot tolerate it. Now, there's something that occurs with this because they don't also um, absorb fat, just like cystic fibrosis, very similar in, into that. Um, in cystic fibrosis, we give a medicine. Uh, they can eat all those foods, but in gluten sensitivity, uh, sen sensitive enteropathy or celiac disease is when you cannot put them in, you cannot ingest them. It's going to cause severe abdominal pain. Uh, I saw one little boy, which is one of my nurse's sons, somehow got into something he shouldn't have. And that poor little kid was there crying. And, and I just wanted to hug him all day because he, he just felt so bad he did wrong. I'm sorry, daddy, I didn't mean to. And, you know, come on, kids are kids. They're going to try. Well, I don't think he'll ever try again, but he will try. So stetorrhea is that Oof, horrible, horrible smelling stool that comes out. Could be foamy. And it's it's the worst smelling stool that you'll ever see. Actually, it's worse than even GI bleeds. And GI bleeds are pretty bad. It's it's bad. You could see abdominal distension because that's the fat. You know, what does fat cause? Bloating. Well, it's going to cause bloating too. So how do we manage this? It's diet. It's all about diet. You know, and if we need to replace some of the vitamins, of course, we'll give vitamin replacement. So look at all the stuff you can eat. Fruits, veggies, chicken, salmon, tuna, beef, dairy, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices. And they can have rice. And today they have rice flour. So they can have rice flour cupcakes and breads and all those things that in the past they couldn't have. So gluten has come a long way. Ever go to the grocery store, the front of the label, gluten-free? That wasn't there even 10 years ago. So it really is a good thing to see that, you know, um, who's ever producing foods are aware of these issues. Now, food allergies go from anaphylaxis to an intolerance, okay? I cannot eat bananas. I cannot eat um, avocados. I have an intolerance. My body doesn't like it. My belly swells up I, and I have gas and the gas that's there and creates pain like no other. So I just don't eat those things anymore. That could be what your child feels, or it could be a little rash, or it could be a low grade fever. It could be a vomiting, could be a diarrhea. Um, we know lactose intolerance, that's diarrhea. They just don't tolerate it. So a food allergy is when they take something that their body doesn't like. I've seen nuts are the worst. 
a kid hit a hand going down the street on the sidewalk. And I, I guess that whoever that person was had eaten nuts. And he got this kid, got it on his hand. And I guess sometimes he touched his mouth or something. This kid went into almost immediate anaphylaxis. I mean, that's what you call sensitivity. Now, the mother did have an EpiPen, gave it immediately, and brought immediately to the ER. Well, let me tell you, the not funny, but it taught me a lesson. I was eating one of those little power nut bars. Oh, it was so good. I had nuts and cranberries, or I don't know what in it, because sometimes you don't get lunch because it's so busy, right? Well, when she told me it was a nut allergy, now I'm triage, I got to run with them. I smell like nuts, I'm full of nuts. And I'm like, mom, you have to carry them. I took alcohol and drenched my hands like crazy. I put a mask on immediately. I didn't want to breathe on them. I got them in the room. Immediately, I'm washing my hands, washing my hands, put on gloves before I'd even touch the kid, get him on a monitor and to watch him. I never had nuts in the ER ever again because that kid taught me a lesson because I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky I, I had a diaper on, right? Because that, that really scared it, really, really scared me. So just a lesson to learn. Now, GI disturbances. When we don't eat, we don't get nutrition, many things happen, right? We've talked about that. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Well, what about that kid who's constantly spitting up? Aren't they losing calories? And when they're losing calories, they're not getting full nourishment and their full nutrition. So they're going to have growth failure. And they might have those cognitive delays, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, growth failure can occur. We know it's due to spitting up. You have kids with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. You have kids with abdominal pain. Well, liver issues is a GI issue, jaundice. And there are some syndromes where they don't eat and swallow right. One of them that I can mention off the top of my head is the George syndrome, Q22 deletion syndrome, has to do with their mouths and the ability to suck, swallow, and breathe. They just can't. Many of them end up with a G-tube. Um, and not and Pierre Robin is another one. So that's two I just gave you, where they sometimes later in life, they're able to eat. And we know fever, what happens? You lose fluid. Fluid um, is lost and antibiotics, same thing. You're gonna be vomiting diarrhea, right? So dehydration is whenever you're losing weight. We know fever is huge. That's one of the things we always look at and we're concerned. Always making sure a kid who's sick, get that fever down and get them drinking. As I said, when they're sick, they're sitting in the corner, don't want nothing get their fever down, and all of a sudden for two or three hours, they're up running around eating and drinking. Make sure we get those fluids in them because we know what dehydration causes, right? Now, it also can be that vomiting and diarrhea. Now, what caused the vomiting and diarrhea? Was it antibiotics you were given? Well, stop the antibiotics, call the doctor. Or, uh, and then we're gonna show you how to treat those in a little bit. And it could be ketoacidosis, diabetes, right? or burns. Well, burns always has, you know, fluid loss there. I love these pictures. I think these pictures tell you a thousand stories about an infant who is dehydrated. That first picture on top, this kid, pale, almost looks green, doesn't he? And that fontanelle is sunken really bad. And the kid's just sitting there. A sunken fontanelle at rest is scary. Now, if they're crying, it usually will puff up a little bit. I don't worry about that. It's when they're at rest, I'm evaluating their fontanelle. And then of course, what are the signs of dehydration? The heart rate's up, the blood pressure's down, prolonged capillary refill, the urine output's going to be going down. And I think the saddest of all is they cry and there's no tears. And you can hear them crying, the poor little things. I'm like, they want to cry. They want to have tears. There's not enough fluid in their body for it. That's a severe dehydration. So what do we do? How's the treatment for dehydration? Well, number one, we want to get an IV in them. And we're going to get a basic metabolic profile. That's the most important thing of getting that IV in. 
because I want to know where's the potassium and their sodium and their chlorides, how dehydrated, their CO2, how bad are they? And of course, we're going to be giving IV fluid uh, replacement. Remember, we never bolus sugar. We never bolus potassium. And we will not be given potassium until the child voids or we have a potassium level, right? Because we could actually kill those kidneys. And if this kid is vomiting, we're going to be giving that antiemetic, that um, a Dunstrung or Zofran, whatever you want to call it. So measuring intake and output. Now, sometimes we don't go crazy in all of the things we could do for measuring. We definitely will do urine, stools, we'll be estimating vomit, not necessarily sweating, unless it's some sort of profuse sweating. And literally you can put like a huge diaper or pad underneath them and you can measure it before and after, you actually can get some sort of weight. Remember diapers are gram per ounce uh, of, uh, grams per ml are what their output is. Again, if you have a diaper that weighs 30 grams and you take it off a child and it's soiled and it weighs 60 grams, your output was 30 mls. The 30 grams is 30 mls. I mean, we can tell a lot just by looking at children, I mean, those kids before, those colors, those pale, the pale ears and lips and tongue, all of those things, you know, are telling you there's no blood perfusing to the extremities, right? It's trying to take care of its organs at this point. You're in trouble. And we know the kid's going to get confused, right? That sensory alteration. They're just going to start to get confused. They're not going to know where they are because a lack of brain um, blood going to the brain, it's going to the organs. Now, diarrhea, <clears throat> all different types of diarrhea, for whatever reason they get it. So we just need to know how to take care of it, right? Now, diarrhea without vomiting, we can give that oral rehydration therapy. We can give it, not a problem. But if the kid is to the point where they're cognitively not aware and they're a little bit lost, that kid needs IV rehydration. But most of the time, we're gonna be giving them Pedialyte, Gatorade or Powerade, one of those things, in order to get those fluids back up. We know that um, when we are measuring for diarrhea, if it's severe, and if we have to put an IV in, always we're gonna be looking at that chemical profile. What are those electrolytes for sure? And after we give the bolus of fluids, then we'll be putting them on a maintenance. A little sugar, a little sodium, and if they need potassium, we'll add it to the IV and run it slowly. Another thing with diarrhea is we're going to be um, putting them back on a diet. No fats, no spicy, no pepper, um, but slowly introduce it. And the other thing that works is lactobacillus. Give them a probiotic, and those probiotics also are going to help stop that um, diarrhea from occurring. Now, constipation is the one thing that children can control is their bowels. Did you know that? I have seen kids hold their stools for seven to 10 days. And when you take an x-ray, it's the whole bowel, the ascending and the descending transverse colon lights up like a Christmas tree with an x-ray. And we're like, how did this kid hold it this long? Sometimes something's going on at home and that's the only way they can show it. It could be stress at home. It could be a divorce. Could you, they moved, the dog got lost. Could be Nana moved away. It could be so many different things. Kids um, have stress. And the way that they tolerate it is different than all of us. So if it's due to that, maybe they need to be able to talk about their feelings, right? Now, constipation in the newborn. This is something that can tell us a lot of different things. You should usually have a stool that looks like this black sticky green stuff called meconium. That should be the first stool. Sometimes they have it as they're delivering, but usually at minimum the first 24 to 36 hours. Now, if there is no stool, what they're gonna, or maybe a tiny little ribbon stool, 
this is something we need to look out for. Something is not right. Kids at birth are going to be stooling. There's no reason why they shouldn't. Well, is there a narrowing in the intestines or is there a, um, a complete non-opening in the intestines? Is it Hirschsprung's disease? We're going to go into that. And look, hypothyroid and cystic fibrosis are two things that will be tested. So they'll be pulling those lab values, that T3, T4, TSH. And they're also going to be doing a um, the sodium test, right, for those um, people with cystic fibrosis, you know, looking for that salt. Is it there? Let's check it out. And then they'll be treating it which way they should. Now, constipation in infancy, when you're breastfed, you have all sorts of stools every day. That's the one, if you're breastfed, you rarely, rarely see um, this kid constipated. Sometimes you're going to see it in formula-fed infants. It's just because of the formula. It's full of more stuff. I mean, breast uh, food, milk is almost like a clear liquid, okay? I mean, it's got all the good stuff in there, but it's like thinner. Um, but formula is thicker with stuff in it. So there's many different things we could do. Well, they don't recommend enemas. They don't recommend, you know, putting them in, on any sort of laxative at this time. Sometimes a physician will say, oh, give them a spoon of prunes, even if it's before six months, to get the bowels moving. It's not for nutrition, because you're going to see it coming out in the stool, right? Because their intestines are still very immature until six months where we start feeding them the foods, but it's going to help them move. Sometimes they give a little apple juice. There's all different, very easy treatments for it. And this is usually what the physician's going to try, first of all. Peptic ulcers. You're saying peptic ulcers in children? Well, you have little worry warts for children. There are some. And all they do is worry, whether it's about their mother, their father, their grandmother, their grandpa, their next door neighbor, their cat, their dog, or maybe it is their schoolwork and it's not good enough. Or maybe it's the kid next to him is bothering him and he's just making me all nervous and jittery. All these things can cause peptic ulcer disease. Now, First way we treat it, of course, diet. Always diet's gonna be number one. But if we need to introduce some sort of medicine, it's gonna be that Zantac. And today they're using Pepsid instead, Fomodine, Famotidine, yes. And um, use the Pepsid. And all that does is decrease the gastric acid production. I have never seen a perforated stomach, but I know I've seen children that are those nervous kids, and this does help with it with the diet. Now, sometimes you do have children with liver disease for whatever reason. Could be a viral hepatitis, non-viral, could be autoimmune, you know, remember lupus, just because they're little doesn't mean they can't get lupus. Could be something metabolic, um, hemodynamic, idiopathic, what we need to know is how do we take care of these kids and how at this young age keep them, you know, growing the way they should. And that's giving them a diet as they're getting bigger um, in order to help because, you know, the liver does digest, digest fats, you know, and fats are a big part of the calories in our food, right? So if we don't have fats, we're going to put them on a low fat diet. Why? Because fat in the diet, they can't digest cause your stomach to bloat and a lot of gas, right? Fat causes gas if we're not digesting it. So high in protein, high in carbohydrates, and that's going to replace the fat. And it also helps with that muscles to keep those muscles strong and working well. And we don't want to give the fat because we don't want these poor little um, children at any age, you know, with stomach pains due to all that gas. Now, Hirschsprung's was one of those things that can cause no stool in the first 24 to 36 hours after birth. We call it a congenital aganglionic megacolon. Well, aganglionic means a, means without, ganglions, nerves. There are no nerves. So with no nerves, how can there be peristalsis? It can't spark a muscle to move, right? 
So it sits there. And then stool and all that stuff can't get down below and it blows up the intestines. And a lot of that, again, is aganglionic. They don't feel the pain, but it, you can actually feel their abdomen and feel this hard thing in there. We would know um, to look for Hirschsprungs, as I said, if there's no stool. Also, remember I said there might be a little tiny little ribbon stool. If you look at the end of this picture, the rectum, it's a tiny little thing that comes out. Sometimes a little bit of stool will squirt out. It's like uh, putting frosting in one of those little bags and squirting it. That little tiny little ribbon, that's what the type, sort of stools you see. We see it a lot more in boys and kids with Down syndrome again. Now, we're suspecting. We don't know yet. We're seeing all the signs, the ribbon stools. We can feel this big lump in the abdomen and we do an x-ray and we see something, well, then we're gonna do a barium studies and they'll do a rectal biopsy. Well, the biopsy is to look for the nerves. And once we find no nerves, what they're gonna do is go in and cut out that piece of intestine. It's got no nerves, it's not functioning. There's no peristalsis. It's doing nothing for the body except holding the stool back and causing distension. So we get rid of it. These children will have a colostomy for the first up to one year of life, and then they will close it, depending. Some are closed in three, four months, some are closed eight, nine months, but usually within one year, they do close them and they can um, have them stooling the proper way by the time they're even considering potty training. Now appendix, you've heard about this in the adult world. It's still the McBurney point, still right lower quadrant. It's all the same care. So you get a kid coming in, <laughs> you know when it's an appendix. If they're walking down the hall to go to a room and they're not in a stretcher, you'll see them bent forward, their right hand will hold their right lower quadrant and they're gonna look a little pale and they're gonna walk like waddling. And you know, oops, that's an appendix. So what is our first thing to do? Well, I'm gonna make them NPO because I know what that kid looks like. And this kid's gonna go over and get a um, ultrasound and then it's determined we start their IV, let's get them to surgery. Now, if we have that ability that it didn't perforate and they had the surgery done, these kids go home the next day. Now. You'll know if it perforated because the pain goes away. If this kid's had horrible pain, all of a sudden it stops, this kid is perforated. And what happens is that area between the small and the large intestines, that little thing that in that cecum area, it explodes. And that's all toxic waste that goes into the peritoneum. And this, it causes massive infection. So infection and it that intestine then gets angry it's being you know it's like putting acid on their intestines so postoperatively you have to rest that intestines and let it heal so npo you could be getting iv fluids to replace fluids of course intake and output here absolutely and iv antibiotics priority care because it's an infection now we're gonna be watching their CBCs. Are their weight count coming down with all these antibiotics? We're gonna be monitoring, of course, their electrolytes, making sure they're getting enough their uh, electrolytes that they do need. And pain control, important. You know, just because they're a kid and it's just an appendix doesn't mean they don't hurt. How about you get out of bed, cough, deep breathe, use incentive spirometry, after the day after an appendix that was ruptured without pain medicine. You're not going to do any of it, are you? That poor, and I've seen nurses try to do it. I'm like, hey, yo, let's give them something for pain. Then the kid's going to get up, not be as in pain, and it's going to be more beneficial. He's going to get that good pulmonary exercise, get out of bed, and he's not going to be just in tears because it does hurt. Now, another thing these kids have, because we want those intestines to be empty, we don't want them to work, we want to let them heal also, they just had acid poured on them, is an NG tube. 
And that NG tube is going to take care of like the stomach acid, right? That's going to always produce. It's going to be there, but we want to get rid of it. We don't want it going into the intestines. We don't want to make the intestines work at all. So an NG tube to keep that stomach, you know, from putting those, that stomach acid down into your intestines. And the other thing we forget is remember, this has burst into the intestines. So even the wall of the peritoneum is infected and we've done the surgery, we've cleaned everything out and then we close it. That's an infected closure. It could dehiss really easy. Make sure you check that wound, okay? Very important part of the assessment because it could dehiss very easily because it's an infected peritoneum, okay? Now, into susception, um, when I first went into the ER, I, I didn't know what an into susception was. I, don't, I didn't remember it. And then I had this kid come in, uh, three years old, because they are usually that two, three, that toddler age. And the kid's legs are just moving like, and he's crying and you can't touch his belly. It's so tender and hard and they're they're miserable there's no position they're inconsolable they hurt and what happens is the intestines the one of the portions sucks up into the other one like a telescope and remember the intestines are full of nerves it hurts okay now sometimes um you check the diaper or check their underwear you might see a little current jelly in the the diaper and it might have some streaks of blood. That is your telltale sign of intussusception, current jelly stool, all right? Now, it's a sudden onset of abdominal pain. And what do we do for this? Well, we send them to ultrasound. Now, that sounds easy enough. Many children, all of a sudden, it will come out and their pain is gone. So you send them to ultrasound and there's nothing. And then it happens again. It could be telescoping in and out. Not many children get it pushed in to the point where it doesn't come out. They might need to have treatment to have it popped out with an air enema, believe it or not. They pump up the rectum, the radiologist, and it pops. Or if that doesn't work, they waited too long, they need surgery. You have to take out that piece of intestines. I've seen surgery once, and I've seen many, many interceptions occur. Many of them, if they by themselves come out, will just increase the roughage in their diet. And if it so happens again and they need, you know, it's not getting better, we tell them to come back to the ER. Now, mechal diverticulum is a weird thing. You're going to see painless rectal bleeding. So you're going to see red blood coming out of the rectum but their tummies really don't hurt. Maybe some slight, tiny little tenderness around the, the umbilicus, but this is small intestines. And there's this little tab, I wanna call it, that pops out into the intestines. And in that is a big blood vessel. And somehow during digestion, it rips. So now this is a vessel, it's a bleeder, that's just bleeding into the intestines. So they go, they do this radionuclide uh, study, they find it, they do surgery, they take that piece out and the kids do well, and there's no uh, long time recovery. But the weird thing is, it's painless. They don't feel it, but you see this bright red blood. IBS, there's all types of IBS, right? We have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Is it a portion or is it mouth to anus, okay? Inflammatory bowels, the whole thing. You know, colitis, Crohn's are pieces of intestines. And mostly with these children, um, we're going to do some sort of medical treatment and, of course, nutritional support for them. And in times of flares, these kids do get their steroids um, to, to, to help them. Short bowel syndrome. Well, sometimes you have an infant who is born and we try to feed them. And for whatever reason, the intestine says, oh, I don't like this. And all of a sudden the intestine starts to die. That is called necrotizing endocolitis. 
It could be a small piece or it could be a really long piece. Now, let me take you back to Jessica. Jessica was in for her second stage surgery. She was six months old and we were feeding her. She was still on a ventilator after surgery and all of a sudden her belly got big. And we were just giving her a little bit of food just to keep the intestines moving. Well, they had to take her to the OR and they had to do surgery. They removed 58 centimeters of her small intestines. Quite significant amount. Small intestines, what does it do? It's absorption, right, of nutrients. So when she was done, yes, she was alive. And I actually, one of the last patients I saw when I left the ER, she was a triplet, group of triplets, and she was my dearest of uh, patients. You know, you're always going to have your favorites. Well, that was my girl. Well, yeah, she was skinny and whatnot, but she was 18 and, you know, she was a pleasant child and she gave me my big hug because I always got my hugs from her. Well, she forever will have short bowel syndrome and it's all about absorption of nutrients. So absorbing nutrients, how do we take care of them? They still got to get nutrition, right? So these children usually will have a probiactin, like that little white tube on that child's chest, and they're gonna get hyperallin lipids at night when they sleep. And then during the day, supplementing their um, oral, whatever they eat by mouth, they'll be getting tube feedings. They're gonna do everything to try to get nutrition into these children. So that's how you treat a short bowel syndrome. So it's all about nutrition. Now, sometimes you see this gastroschisis, the stomach is born on the outside of the body. You, the baby comes out and there's the stomach on the outside. The, the, it didn't close. So it's, you know, the intestines are hanging out like. So when you have a gastroschisis, nursing responsibility, you've got to keep that area clean and free from infection. So they put something over it to keep the infection free. And surgery comes in and slowly we'll push it down in and finally they'll close it. Now everything's connected, it all works, but it's born on the outside. We're gonna see that with the bladder, we're gonna see that with the um, stomach, and then it's part of the spine. We're gonna see three different things that born on the outside of the body. And that's our big thing that has to do, infection, anything born on the outside. Now hernias. There's all different sort of hernias. I mean, I like the little umbilical ones you push in and out and they're soft and I like to play with them. I just think they're pretty neat. And the kid goes, ooh, it tickles, tickles. Now, when you push it and it's hard, it's red and painful, uh, then you have an incarcerated hernia. Incarcerated, strangulated, whatever you wanna call it. And it requires immediate surgery. That means it's twisted. Blood supply has cut off. They need to take that kid to the OR, untwist it, or remove a piece and sew them back up. Um, umbilical hernias can last. They can be there. Most parents will fix them in order just for, you know, appearance. So the kids, when they're older, they're not teasing them, right? And then the worst of all of the hernias is what we call diaphragmatic hernia. And you could see their intestines are born in their chest. So can you imagine trying to oxygenate that child at birth? This is an extremely ill child, a diaphragmatic hernia. Many of those end up on that ECMO or that heart lung type machine right after birth to get oxygen to those children. Um, and they're gonna be left with one lung, one side, only the right side. Um, the left side, it never comes back. It's a little bud and it's nothing there. So diaphragmatic are pretty bad. Malrotation and vulvus. Uh, these are just things where the intestine, something, uh, the way that they were born it was either you um, have the intestines around an artery pulling it so it's occluding flow or vulvus. It's like you've got a knot in your intestines. And these kids will show up really bad pain. Usually it's actually like the left upper. Uh, quadrant is where I've seen a lot of it. But again, it acts just like that appendix. It's intestines that can't move. So it's going to be painful. It can perforate. And again, that's peritonitis. So these kids, again, will go to surgery. Same treatment as you would do an appendix, whether you catch it before or after it's burst. 
Now there's something that we call an imperforated anus. Why do you think you do a rectal temp on all newborns at birth? Do you think it's just to check their temperature more accurately, what you were told in OB? No, you're checking to see if they have an anus. It is part of that twofold thing, because it's missed. This is something that will be missed. That's why we do that, okay? So now you know the real reason why we check rectal temperatures. So if they don't have it, they're gonna have to have a colostomy. And hopefully in time they could do reconstructive type of surgeries, do something in order to help that child have a stool out the rectum. But it's several, several surgeries and it takes time to get that done. You know, there are some times where you're changing a diaper and you see in stool coming out of vaginas or urine coming out of rectums. There are all sorts of fistulas that can occur with children. So um, I've actually caught a few where you're wiping and you see in urine coming out of the, the, the rectum. Like, oh, what is this? Or you're, you know, cleaning a little girl and you see stool coming out of their vaginas. These are things that do need to be fixed because again, infection can occur if this is stool. Now vomiting, there's all sorts of vomiting. Now kid vomits, this is like this little sort of um, usually just dribbles or maybe you know a little bit comes out but it's not like across the room. There's projectile and there's forceful. Projectile, something different. Um, usually the kid might retch and then vomit. Now, if a kid's vomiting, they can't drink, right? So we got to do something, especially if they're showing signs and symptoms of dehydration. They're showing those signs. Again, metabolic profile is your priority. How, how badly are they dehydrated? And get that IV in, of course, no dextrose, no electrolytes, and give that bolus and give nothing to eat for that child until we give some sort of anti-emetic for them. And children love to put everything in their mouth, right? Explore the world through their mouths. I have seen them eat rat poison, those Tide Pods, and not because they wanted to, these were smaller kids, these weren't adolescents messing around. Um, I've seen them eat grandma's um, cardiac medicines, but most of all, I've seen them eat their vitamins. And actually, of all of those, have them eat the vitamins. Because when you don't, when you have vitamins and you don't need it, your body just excretes them. And it's not toxic, believe it or not. If they're with iron now, that's toxic. But we usually don't give vitamins with iron today. Those Flintstone things. Now, Remember, Tylenol is liver toxic. So if they're going to get into the drinking the medicines, so what we tell you is please keep your stuff somewhere where the kids can't reach it because the kids are very creative and climbing and getting things. So making sure that they're locked um, and they can't get to them so that you don't have to spend the time in the ER. You know, and always have the poison control number around. That's the most important thing on these kids. Another thing is if you're in a neighborhood that's older, you know, I always say New York City, but there's more than just New York City that has older homes. Little toddlers like to go up to the window and look out and there's usually windowsills. And what do they do? They chew on them, right? Everything in their mouth. They're teething. And what they're doing is they're getting lead paint. And remember, lead is dangerous, can cause seizures. And we treat it with chelation therapy, whether it's the desferin, giving the medicine so they excrete through the kidney or putting them on an apheresis machine and to get rid of it, like almost like a kidney dialysis, but just get through the component. So very important to remember those things. Now, most common thing with kids, gastric, gastroesophageal reflux, GER or GERD, whatever you want to call it. This is when the food keeps coming up and they keep, you know, spitting up, spitting up. Again, they're losing nutrition. That's the number one thing. But number two, if they keep spitting up, the chance for aspiration gets pretty high. Now, in infants, we see that little blurb coming out all the time. And usually it's the parents have overfed or um, these kids need something to thicken their formula a little bit. Now, you're taught not to give any food to young 
infants until they're six months old, right? Well, if a kid has reflux, we'll put a little bit of rice cereal in their formula and it will hold and thicken that formula or breast milk down, okay? I mean, you're gonna see the rice cereal in the stool, but it did what it needed to do. It got that milk to stay down. Now, sometimes you have older kids who have reflux. Think about food coming up and trickles to the lungs and causes many aspirations, right? You're gonna hear them coughing. And if it's refluxing up with that stomach acid, it hurts, right? You're gonna feel that heartburn. That's the telltale sign of the younger children, two, three, four, five-year-olds. How do we treat it? Well, again, looking at their diet, maybe putting them on medical treatment of that Pepsid or, um, and there's many, many medicines today that we can use. And I've seen some kids on four or five just to hold their foods down, depending on the child. But there's another thing we can do. Ever hear of getting a gastrostomy tube and getting a Nissan fundal plication with a gastrostomy tube? And you're like, what is a Nissan fundal plication? Well, just think, what does a G-tube do? You take a big bolus of fluid and dump it in the stomach and hope it doesn't come up and out the mouth, right? Well, they do this Nissan fundal plication and they bring up the back of the stomach and flip it around so there's no way for it to get down and get back up into vomiting it. You don't want these kids to aspirate, right? So these kids don't vomit. So it keeps the food down. With severe reflux, that's the most severe treatment they do. A Nissan fundal plication to keep the food down. Because you can burn your esophagus and cause a lot of other stuff going on. And I've seen kids get to that point. So a Nissan fundal plication, you'll always, well, unless the parent says no, but if, you, you know, a medical a science gets what they want, every gastrostomy tube will have a Nissan fundal plication, and that's to prevent reflux, okay? Very simple. Now, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. These are your little itsy bitsy babies. This is the little kid from three weeks to about three months. Mother comes in and says, my kid is vomiting. My first question, does it dribble down the face or does it shoot across the room? And if it shoots across the room, usually the mother is holding the infant. I'll take my hand and go underneath the xiphoid process, uh, process in the chest, right where the stomach is. And I'll feel a little hard marble or olive, whatever you want to call it. The pyloric sphincter in the lower stomach gets thickened and muscular and food can't go down into the small intestines. So they eat, eat, eat. These kids are normal. They eat, eat, and then all of a sudden they're sitting there and psh, it comes out. And I'm telling you, be careful. It shoots across the room. You can actually point them towards the garbage can and they can make it. I mean, this is how forceful that they have vomit out. So when they tell me it's forceful, number one thing I say, nothing more to eat or drink, please. These kids are hungry. They're getting no nutrition. It's not going down. So they eat, vomit, want more, eat, vomit, want more. And finally, they get them in. Dehydration is the biggest thing we're concerned about, right? But most young infants with parents, they get these kids in pretty quickly. So put them in PO, get them IV started. We're going to do an ultrasound. We see it. We send them to the OR. They take and they'll do this, um, this valve. They'll, they'll stretch it so that food goes through. They're not going to have problems the rest of their life. And life is good. The next day, start them on clear liquids up to whether it's formula or breast milk. And the kids are home in a day or two. And they do really well. But can you imagine a parent, a mother of a three-week to three-month-old infant? She's panicking. This is her new itsy-bitsy little baby, right? So mommy needs a lot of hugs there. Now, cleft lips. Now, cleft lips are those things where the lip doesn't close. And it could be on one side, two sides. It could be go into the palate on one side or two sides. But when these kids are born, they have a, 
this this look of you know just their mouth hanging out and it's uh, can be very scary for parents so the lip because what do kids need to do how do they self-soothe they need to suck right they need to be able to put their mouth around a bottle and get some food going in there and they need to suck and swallow and breathe so we will close that lip and it's not plastic closure because we have to get all the lines of the lip all matched up well, right? And we'll do it between two to three months. And do you see that little metal thing there? That's so they don't smush their face in the bed so that we, we, we protect that um, incision line there, right? As I said, it could be any of those type of things. Now, sometimes the palate is not there. Um, and if you don't have a palate, if you're drinking, it can come out your nose. Think about it. The palate covers the nose. So it's like right into the sinuses and out your nose. So this is a little bit more extensive surgery, but we want to get that fixed before they start talking. If you've ever seen a person who didn't have repair early in life or not an appropriate pair repair, they will talk like this because they can't make that, you know, uh, sound in their mouths because they don't have a palate. So before they can talk, we want to get this fixed because it will affect their speech. And these kids will be getting speech therapy um, because of that there to make sure. These kids do great. You know, they do really well with it. See a lot of that again with Pierre Robin syndrome. You'll see the lip or the palate. I've seen just a palate on a Pierre Robin and the kid today is perfect and he's normal. Now, it's two to three months before we fix that lip, right? Well, what about that breastfeeding mom? It's gonna be hard, they can't suck. So this mother's gonna literally have to squeeze her breast as the kid's trying to suck. It's gonna take a lot of patience for this mother. Now, if they use a bottle, you see that bottle, that top portion, it is soft, very soft. And you put it in the mouth and the bottle fills into that long thing and slowly as they suck, you squeeze it little by little. So when they think they're sucking, they're getting milk in their mouth and they're swallowing and they do well. Because remember, you don't feed, they don't get nutrition, we're gonna have cognitive delays and of course, growth failure. Another condition of children is esophageal atresia. Remember, A is no, nothing without, means it doesn't connect to a stomach, all right? So it just dangles there. So you swallow, it goes down into this tube and then probably comes up, you aspirate it and they're gargling and they can't get rid of this secretion. So when they're born and they're foaming and bubbling at the mouth, something's going on if they can't get that down there, okay? And then the other one, tracheal esophageal fistula, a connection between the esophagus and the trachea. They follow, swallow food down the esophagus and whoop, across that the little tube into the lungs. Again, gagging, choking is what you do see. So how do we treat this? This kid can't eat. Any way it eats, it's going to aspirate. These kids are NPO. And remember, they got all this mucus in their mouth. So suction at the bedside, head of the bed elevated on the warmer, or the crib, or wherever they are. That is our job, keeping that airway open and keeping it ready. These kids are healthy, normal kids. They just don't have a connection. During the fetal um, uh, de development, it just didn't uh, connect it. Now, even with the most meticulous care, we know that children are gonna have these little mini aspirations no matter what we do. So they're gonna need antibiotics to prevent an infection, right? Makes sense? If you have an aspiration pneumonia, how do we treat it? No matter how you got to pneumonia, you're still gonna give antibiotics. So these kids will have IV fluids and they're gonna be getting antibiotics. They repair these things and these kids do really well. Sometimes they do it earlier on. Um, and sometimes they'll say, let's wait and put a G-tube in, the kids get bigger. All depends on the condition of the, of the child. Are they a cardiac kid with all of this? Or is it a normal healthy kid we can do quicker? 
It all depends on every child. I've seen it both ways, where they put a G-tube in, the kid came back in eight months and had the connection surgery and did well. And I've had seen kids have it done right at birth and never had to wait, never had a G-tube. A lot of different stuff, huh? So some things that you've never even seen in the um, thing. Is there a certain age to start pulling the skin back for the boys uncircumcised? Yeah, at birth, every day at birth, every day it should be pulled back. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a real, real true story. My grandson was born and he, we weren't gonna circumcise him. My daughter didn't want to. I'm like, okay, it's whatever your choice is. It's not my child, it's yours. Um, and she was living with me at the time and she tried to pull back the foreskin. I said, the only thing, make sure you keep it clean. You're in our tract infections, right? I'm teaching her good. Couldn't. So within one month, we had to have that kid circumcised because that's, it was so tight or phimosis, tight foreskin, couldn't pull it down. So we had to have it removed. And we did it in the doctor's office with a pacifier with sugar water. And actually, I heard the kid cry during the procedure, but as soon as they took him out of this restraint, he stopped crying. It was being restrained he didn't like. It wasn't necessarily the pain of the circumcision. So that was a great question, Brittany. I like that one. Thanks. All right, let's go to our cahoots for today. Who wants to win? Come on, Raphael, you got to win this time. Thank you. <laughs> Five, three, six, one, three, oh, eight. Yeah, let's get going. Week eight, G-I-G-U. Of course, we start out with a multi. All the following are symptoms of dehydration in an infant, except what? Right? That's what can be the answer there. Which ones are signs? What do you see? Elevated heart rate, low blood pressure, decreased skin turgor, uh, prolonged capillary refill, dry skin, pale, weak, lethargic, loss of, you know, uh, orientation, decreased urine output, all of the above in any type of patient, whether they're an adult or kid, same thing. And in Fontenelle, we would see a sunken Fontenelle. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? So if a kid is vomiting, what are you gonna do? So if a kid is vomiting, you can't give anything by mouth. You're, you know, of course they're going to be NPO, but treatment, priority treatment, get IV fluids in and giving them a bolus. Remember, ringer's lactate, normal saline, no dextrose and no electrolytes in that bolus solution. What is the treatment for an infant with diarrhea lasting for four days? <clears throat> So when we are talking about an infant and diarrhea, we're gonna be starting that PDLA. We can feed because they're not vomiting, all right? They don't have to be NPO. 
Now, the only reason why we would do um, IV fluids if the kid was, you know, severely dehydrated, but just a kid having diarrhea, there's no mention of, you know, being that bad. Just give them oral electrolyte solution. Diarrhea, we're going to give PO. Vomiting, IV. What acid-base imbalance might you see with a child having profuse diarrhea? So they said, I'm going to be giving you some acid-base uh, ABG type questions um, almost every cahoots from now on, because there was four on the last HESI. So when you have diarrhea, what are you losing? So all the enzymes are alkalotic. So you're losing alkaline. So you're left with acidosis. Okay, does that make sense for you now? All right. So you're losing alkaline with diarrhea. Now, if you were vomiting, what acid base would you see? I'm vomiting acid. I'm left with alkaline, okay? So remember that. Stomach, you have acid coming out. If you're talking about alkaline, you're talking about those enzymes, you only have the acid. So you gotta think of which is which, and then it's the opposite of what they're losing. A multi. An infant's not past meconium stool in the first 24 to 36 hours. What would you assess for? So we're going to be worried about hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, Hirschsprung's disease. There's no reason to look for an electrolyte imbalance, okay? But we're looking for those diseases that sometimes we don't even know before the, um, the baby's born to even look for them. Deficiency of vitamin D causes. Remember we were talking about different vitamins and minerals that you know, we need to be looking at, they can lose. Well, which one is that called? And it's caused rickets. Vitamin D is important for bones and joints and tendons, okay? So it's called rickets, brittle bones. A multi. What treatment can the nurse anticipate to a child unable to eat or drink anything with profuse vomiting and diarrhea? So if this kid is vomiting, we are not giving even sips of water. We are not going to put anything in their mouth, but we want to give IV fluids and we want to know what their electrolyte, electrolytes are. So basic metabolic profile, know how much fluid really we need to give. And of course, the vital signs will be checking too. Another, what nursing management would you anticipate for a child with a ruptured appendix postoperatively. So remember, this appendix has burst, spewing all sorts of disease and pestilence into the peritoneum, and it's creating havoc inside that abdomen. So we're gonna give IV antibiotics, we'll give pain medicine, they're going to have an NG suction because that intestines is so angry and because that surgical site was closed on an infected abdomen, we're going to be looking at it. Now, postoperatively, we still need to do post-op care, deep breathing, coughing, getting out of bed, ambulating, all of those things. So no, not bed rest. They need to be active to prevent those complications. Mm. Passage of urine, usually at night in children who should have voluntary bladder control.
and that's called aneurysis. Now, while we're on this slide, let me explain epispadius and hypospadius. Now, boys can be born and the urethra sometimes doesn't go to the tip of the penis. Sometimes it goes dorsally and that's hypospadius. It doesn't come out to the end, it comes underneath. And that's where the urine comes out of that hole. Or epispadius is ventral, on top. The epispadius, the hole comes from the top. Now, these children, you cannot um, do a circumcision. Before they get to the age of being even considered potty controlled, we need to fix that penis so that the urine comes out the end. They need the foreskin for the plastic closure to do it. Now, then they make the, the inside the tube to connect all of it. Postoperatively, there'll be a tube sitting there, a little catheter per se, and that's gonna be in there for about 10 days. We don't do anything. We just make sure it's stuck inside the, the diaper so that we don't get urine everywhere. And these kids do really well. Now, the one time it's a problem, what if you're Jewish and you wanna do a brisk? You have to leave that circumcision, that circumcision can't be done because you need the skin for this closure. So these are things that we have to remember, you know, to help parents through. What is Hirschsprung's disease? <clears throat> so Hirschsprung's is where you don't have nerves in your descending colon. It's called a megacolon, right? So we have to remove it. We have to give this kid a colostomy for almost the first year of their life, and then they'll reconnect it most of the time. That one of the symptoms of the Hirschsprungs is ribbon stools because it just squirts out a little bit on that little ending. Another multi. When teaching parents about Hirschsprung's disease, the nurse would include. So it can cause a bowel obstruction because it can't get down. So you're always going to be monitoring those bowel habits to make sure that they're stooling properly. And it is two stage. Now, we do not ever really want to treat a child with laxative or enemas. That's only for emergent care, okay? We would do something with the diet first before that. What types of stools would an infant with Hirschsprung's disease have? <clears throat> I mean, that big outpatch anganglionic colon, and it goes this tiny little down to the anus. And as I said, it looks like frosting that you would do a cake decoration with. That's what it reminds me of. And it's what we call ribbon shaped stools, okay? What is a condition that occurs mainly in children when the intestines telescope into itself? It just sucks into itself. And it's called intussusception. Remember, this is sudden onset, severe abdominal pain. These kids are screaming, they're inconsolable. And you might see that little bit of current jelly or blood in their diaper or in their uh, underwears. A gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. <laughs> what is that? And that's when the food just goes up into the esophagus. Remember the most radical of all that treatment would be that Nissan fundoplication, right? 
but usually it's treated with diet and as simple as a pepsid. Inflammatory bowel disease involves what? IBS is what? <clears throat> It's mouth to anus, anywhere in the intestines, right? Anywhere that has to do with food, mouth to anus. And when you get to Crohn's, you know, those, those are segments. What would the nurse be looking for when a patient has mechal diverticulum? Remember, this is painless rectal bleeding. Um, you might have some tenderness in the abdomen. It's a surgical repair, and actually they do very well. Six-year-old goes to the ER due to abdominal pain, fever, vomiting for the last day. What assessment is priority? Like, what do you need to know? What assessment? So where is that abdominal pain? You know, is it, you know, um, underneath your sternum? Is it the right upper quadrant, lower? It'll tell you, is it a surgical emergency or a medical emergency, right? What would the nurse expect to see in an infant with biliary atresia? Well, there is a biliary duct which connects your small intestines the common bile duct to the liver. And atresia means that's not there. A, it's without. So what is the liver doing? It's not being able to put the bile into the common bile duct, into the small intestine. So you don't have bile. You're going to have these very pale, pale stools. You're going to see jaundice. You're going to see abdominal distension because of fat, right? Because the bile does absorb fat. So you've got big bellies too. This is one of the things you start to see. I mean, you might start seeing that sclera turning yellow too. What structure of the mouth can be impacted by cleft lip and palate? <laughs> I mean, I love this picture because this kid did really well and he had bilateral. It's everything, hard palate, soft palate, and the lip, all of them. And again, lip is done two to three months, palate, and eh, six to 12 months. Cleft lip repairs typically done when? And that's usually about two to three months, right? We try to get that closed earlier so they can put a seal because children self-soothe with their mouth. So we want them to be able to do that. When does a cleft palate repair typically occur? And it's because it's that bone up there, sometimes they use a piece of the rib to go in there to uh, close it up. And that's between six to 12 months. We like to do it before they start talking because if we don't, they're gonna have speech problems and we don't want that. Esophageal atresia. Remember, A means without, that means nothing. Like tricuspid atresia, no connection between the right atrium and ventricle. Esophageal atresia means no connection between
the esophagus and the stomach and it's at birth. What are we worried about? Well, there's nowhere for all of that stuff they're swallowing. Your mouth is always wet, creating you know, saliva. We're aspirating it. So these kids, we worry about aspiration pneumonia all the time. MPO IV antibiotics is the treatment before and after surgery. What are the classic signs of esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula? Remember, they know where for that fluid to go and everywhere it goes is into the lungs. <coughs> Olive shaped mass, that's pyloric stenosis, right? And then they're projectile vomiting, current jelly stools. This is your intussusception. So this is where you swallow. There's nowhere to go except the lungs. They're going to gag and choke and cough. Have you ever aspirated a curl of rice or a piece of bread, toast? It, it's horrible. And that's what these infants would look like. Oh, multi. Neonate with suspected tracheoesophageal fistula, nursing care should include. So, we're going to be given IV fluids. We're going to be giving antibiotics, absolutely, for those aspirations. We're going to have the head of the bed elevated so we can at least get that mucus out, that saliva. And we're not going to feed these kids. You want to feed the kids? You're going to you have them suck, swallow, right into their lungs. And now you have a really bad aspiration pneumonia. A five-year-old child is complaining of epigastric pain and a persistent cough. What would you suspect? And that's going to be good because they're constantly, they're refluxing up their esophagus and they're having these little mini aspirations. It burns, it hurts, and that cough is that aspiration. What is ranitidine used for in a child with peptic ulcer disease? Whether it's ranitidine or famitidine, any of those. It has to do with decreasing the amount of ulcer, the acid to prevent ulcers um, or decrease, you know, the chances of ulcers getting bigger. So we want to give them, number one, it's diet, of course, and then the medicine is to keep that acid um, reduced. Signs and symptoms of a hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So hypertrophic means it's thick, it's muscular, it's stenosis, it's a narrowing pyloric sphincter is at the end of the stomach and food can't go through. So this very thickened muscular valve, you're going to feel an olive or a marble, whatever you want to call it. And you really can feel it there. And again, it's projectile across the room. Aim the child at the garbage can and they're going to hit it. They really do. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Number one assessment. What are you going to see? And it's the first question I ask parents when they tell me their small little infant is vomiting. Is it coming out, just dribbling around? Or is it across the room projectile? Because pyloric stenosis is projectile. Preoperative treatment of pyloric stenosis includes
Well, as soon as I know they're projectile vomiting NPO, I'm going to start an IV and we're going to start replacing fluids because they're going to be a little bit dehydrated. But usually parents get them in pretty quick, which is good. What does a celiac disease affect? Where in the body? All those little villi, it has to do with absorptions and foods. And remember, it does affect fat absorption. It is the small intestines, okay? That's where all food is broken down and absorbed and used by the body. Celiac disease. And if you have celiac disease, what should you eliminate from your diet? Is wheat, rye, barley, oats, all of those sort of flours, which are all in flours and cookies and cereals and breads. So the only thing they can have is rice. And as I said, rice flour is available now. So there's many different things. And they can have chocolate and they can have dairy and they can have vegetables and they have fruit. So there's, there's a lot of different alternatives for these children. A multi. Vitamins that children with celiac disease are prone to lose are, remember it has to do with fat absorption. Which one of these are fat soluble vitamins? And which are water soluble vitamins? <clears throat> Excuse me. So vitamin C is a water soluble, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K. So these are things that we need to replace if we need to on these children and being monitored very closely. Vitamin C, um, they're getting it because it's water. What foods would you select for a child with celiac disease? All of those lists of foods I've given you, what would you feed a kid? I mean, when you look at all the choices, French toast is bread, fish sticks has breading, macaroni has noodles, and then garlic bread on the last one. So all of those things do have whether wheat, rye, barley, or oats into it. So an omelet, a fruit, banana, and a glass of milk, absolutely good. Bimosis. I told you about this one about my grandson. And that was the main reason that he had to have a circumcision. If I can't get this foreskin down, there's a problem. So I said, I'm sorry, Dania. It's going to have to have surgery. There's nothing you can do here. It's way, way too tight. And it could cause a lot of problems in the future. So she did opt and we did have that circumcision, like I told you. What is a hydro seal? <clears throat> As I said, I can't cover everything in a lecture, so sometimes I'm going to give it to you in a, a question on the cahoots so that you um, are shown what these things are. And hydro means water, right? It's fluid in the testes. It's painful. And actually, we treat it with antibiotics, okay? Sometimes they're incontinent, and that's the only sign and symptom of a hydrocele. What is a crypto orchidism? Well, it has to do with males. I love the picture of that monkey. <laughs> well, when you go to the pediatrician with a boy, baby, the first visit, going to check the hips, make sure there's no dysplasia. 
and he's going to check the scrotal sac to see if the testicles have been distended. Sometimes the testicle doesn't come down. Now, if it doesn't come down after a certain amount of time, they might have to do surgery. And the reason is because the testicles do not like that hot, warm environment inside the abdominal cavity. It has to come down or that testicle will die. So it is the lack of those testicles, whether one or two, that don't come down and fill the scrotal sac. You suspect an infant has cryptoorchidism. How would you examine this child? Think about testicles and males. When you have a male with, with a scrotal sac, when it's cold, it's going to suck in, okay? When it's warm, it's going to hang, and that's what you want. So put them in a warm room, and now you've got the best chance of being able to feel those testicles, and that's why we want it in a warm room. Sitting them up and all those things, no. Warm room is the most important. A hypospadias is... I told you earlier. They've started to put questions on hypospadiasis on your HESI and the NCLEX. That's why I'm making sure I cover it well. When you talk about a hypospadias, you're talking about where is this and where, where should you look, okay? And remember, it's an opening, not at the tip of the penis. It's somewhere else. A multi-select. So how do you correct this hypospadias? So you have the penis, and it comes either down the bottom or on the top and it doesn't come to the tip. So we need to get that connection, that tube going to the end of the penis. So we use the foreskin. We, they actually splay open that penis. It's under general anesthesia, okay? They splay it open. And then they take and make the opening, use the foreskin to use it to cover it up. Then they put in this little catheter or stent, a tube, that will allow that opening to maintain and um, heal so that you have an opening to the tip of the penis. And then what do we do with that little tube? Nothing, keep it in a diaper. So you're gonna remove it about 10 days after surgery. That'll be the urologist, not you. So what is a bladder extra fee? I briefly mentioned it with gastroschisis. <coughs> It's one of those other things that can happen. <clears throat> and you know, I've seen gastroschisis many times. I've never seen a bladder extrophy, believe it or not, in all of the years of working in a newborn ICU. And it's just the midline doesn't close right. The bladder's up there. No, the bladder's connected to everything. It still works, but it's exposed to the environment, okay? So again, your priority is infection control of that. And eventually they'll put it back in and close it. And there's going to be no problems. It all works the right way. What is the priority nursing care for an infant with bladder extrophy? You got bladder sitting out there. We've got to make sure that it keeps moist and that it doesn't, you know, try to shrivel up and dry up. We need to keep that there, but we need to maintain that infection control with it also. So it's something that we'll be watching really closely. 
they don't urinate out of the bladder. They still urinate out of their penis or their urethra normally. That's normal, but it's that bladder out there that we have to keep it, uh, the tissue intact. What are clinical manifestations of nephrotic syndrome? Remember, nephrotic syndrome has nothing to do with renal failure, nothing. Has everything to do with loss of protein. So hypoalbuminemia occurs in the blood, the protein or albumin is gone. Albumin protein is the same name. And of course, fluid is going interstitially. So it's all of the above. Children with nephrotic syndrome are often given what medications for fluid overload? So remember, the fluid overload is interstitially. We need to pull it out of the interstitial space intravascularly and get rid of it. How can we do that? <clears throat> so we're going to replace protein, right? And that followed by furosemide, a dose is going to make you urinate. I mean, sometimes they're going to use steroids for this also, depending on it. But if we replace the protein inter intervascularly, it's going to pull the fluid out when it's all in the tissue. What is used to treat nephrotic syndrome in children? We also know it's a low sodium diet, fluid restrictions, watching out for infections. Intake output, daily weights, but prednisone is used also. It's not an infection, so it's not antibiotics, okay? And it's not just looking at their fluid balance. It's a part of the whole picture. Steroids are part of it too. Anti-inflammatory, calm down those kidneys. A child is admitted with acute glomerulonephritis. What recent illness could validate this finding? What did I tell you causes acute glomerulonephritis? And that's the strep throat. So strep throat, throat causes it. It's not a viral infection like other things. It is a pharyngitis. What is a priority nursing care of a child with nephrotic syndrome? Remember, nephrotic syndrome is all about an edematous child, and we're trying to get rid of this fluid overload, and we're trying to, you know, get the protein back in these kids, and how do we know all this stuff is working? And it's daily weights, and we're going to decrease and monitor the salt intake and decrease fluid fluids on these children. And of course, monitoring those weights, we can see them losing the weight. We know it's working. Why is erythropoietin used in chronic kidney failure? And these are sub Q injections that we can give. Whether it's weekly, daily, it all depends on physicians. I've seen them given both ways. <clears throat> <clears throat> So it increases the production of red blood cells and decreases how many times you have to give blood transfusions to these kids and decreasing the amount decreases risk. So that's what we want to do. Another multi. A child with chronic kidney disease can have renal osteo osteodystrophy. What can this do to the child? Well, osteodystrophy. What does osteo mean? And what does dystrophy mean? Pull the word apart.
I mean, it was like things like um, muscular dystrophy. Okay, so that has to do with muscles and problems. Well, osteo is skeletal problems. And if they're not growing the way they should, you're going to have growth retardation. And then it could be high parathyroidism has a lot to do with calcium in the child, right? Parathyroid calcium. So these are the things that you can see with chronic kidney disease, that renal osteodystrophy, something that we're gonna be monitoring. Height, weight, right? That's why we take those things and then monitoring their calcium levels also. A diagnostic finding of acute glomerular nephritis may be. Well, maybe you don't remember which kid, you have six kids, you don't remember who had a sore throat or not. And you need to go look. Well, I don't remember, maybe. Well, you could do a blood test that says, have you had strep in the recent past? And it's called a positive anti-strepolicin, ASO titer. Look at what it, anti-strep. Do you see that strep in the middle there? That's showing the kid had strep. And that will say, okay, that's the reason why. And now we can treat it, give the antibiotics. Which complication of peritoneal dialysis is most important? As in most important to avoid. <clears throat> Because when we're talking about peritoneal dialysis, you know, we're not using kidneys. There are no kidneys. We're using the peritoneal cavity. So if we have abdominal peritonea, uh, peritonitis, we have an infection in the place that's supposed to be using this area to filtrate for the kidneys. So we don't want to, and we want to prevent it as much as possible, abdominal peritonitis. What clinical assessments most important to report with a child diagnosed with an acute kidney trauma? You know, I've seen one of these kidney traumas by a kid running around playing tag. And he walked, was running around this trailer and he was going backwards fast and he ran into a trailer hitch, right at the area of his left kidney. He came into triage with a huge bruise over his kidney. They did electrolytes. His potassium was like seven point something. He had really bad, they're worried about a fractured kidney. And of course he was admitted, but potassium, think kidney, trauma, think potassium. Very good. Another multi. What should the nurse anticipate for a child who just had a renal biopsy? So whenever you have a, a renal biopsy, number one, you've touched a kidney. You want to make sure that kidney is not going to be hurt. So you're going to monitor intake and output. Very important. That dressing, it could be oozing urine. So you're going to look at that. Or even blood if you hit some sort of capillary or blood vessel. And then again, just like cardiac calf, bed rest 24 hours. Protect that clot that sealed that kidney for 24 hours never out of bed because it could cause it to open and then you could be open for more problems. What would you do if the fluid draining from a peritoneal dialysis liquid has changed color and is now cloudy? What does that mean? So there's probably an infection. So immediately you're going to call the doctor. And then the doctor, of course, is going to order antibiotics. But you need the doctor to order the antibiotics. Very good. And last question. What would the nurse provide to an infant that cannot eat normally? What if you had that tracheoesophageal fistula and you can't feed them? Because feeding them causes aspiration. 
what you need to do to promote normal growth and development. You're gonna give them a pacifier and you're not gonna put anything in their mouth because it could create aspirations and problems, okay? So remember, they self-soothe through their mouth. The mouth is so important, so a pacifier. Number three, E-H. Number two, Della. Good job, Della. Number one, Lisa. Good job, Lisa. Number four, Kayla and Nicole. All right. Um, remember, you do have those evaluations that you can sign up. They're called midterm evaluations. You know, if you could do them, I'd appreciate it. I know that we ask a lot and a lot of valuations all the time, but they are important for us to be able to, you know, give you what you need. So if you can, I would appreciate that. Okay, you're going to be taking your quiz now. You've heard everything and I know that you're going to do well. It's not a bad quiz at all. So if you want, pull yourself up to your modules, go to quiz five. You may start. Anybody who wants to go over their evalu your, your exams from last week, make an appointment. I'd be love more than welcome to do that. Or if anybody wants to talk to me, make an appointment. Okay, guys? And thank you so much. <laughs>